Welcome to The Grizzly Beat, a podcast of Grizzly Times and Louisa Wilcox, where we interview scientific experts, managers, Native Americans, writers, and others to share their knowledge, perspectives, and experience. This comes at a time of enormous interest in the grizzly bear's future as the government proposes to remove federal protections and citizens are asking important questions. We hope the information shared here will help listeners shape their own answers. So this is Louisa Wilcox with the Grizzly Beat, and we're here today with Drs. Paul Paquette and Chris Dearmont. Um, Paul and Chris are both world-renowned experts on predators and their wild ecosystems. And they both have uh, publications, a huge number of publications, as long as your arm. Uh, And they may look conventional on paper, but in reality, they're kind of rebels, and they represent a serious challenge in some ways to conventional wildlife management uh, because in addition to researching the animals and their ecosystems, they have expressed uh, concern about the welfare of wildlife. Um, For example, um, if you shoot an alpha wolf female, uh, you not only inflict uh, terrible impacts on uh, the pups, uh, but also terrible, terrible, tragic impacts on the pack and impacts far, far beyond. And they have been raising concerns about wildlife impacts from uh, our management uh, and our shooting and our hunting practices for a long, long time. And they're making headway, and we're here to talk about that. Uh, But first, um, let's have them introduce themselves. So, Paul. Uh, you're now a father figure in the field of large carnivore conservation in North America and around the world uh, with degrees in philosophy and wildlife behavior and conservation and a Ph.D. in zoology from the University of Alberta. And you have a long-lasting focus on wolves, uh, starting with your research in Riding Park in Manitoba. What did you, you know, discover? I, <laughs> what? I do. <laughs> no, that's correct. Yeah. 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 What did you discover about wolves there, and what fuels your interest in? Well, let me back up there uh, a bit, yeah. and uh, you know, it's it's interesting to be called a, a father figure, uh, given that uh, sort of the, the inspirations for me were other father figures, and and then of course colleagues. Uh, but the, I, these were people that I was certainly inspired by, by like uh, Michael Soule and uh, Aldo Leopold and others, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, my interest in wolves and my first work on wolves really began much earlier in, uh, with captive wolves, and, and that's on captive behavior, and, uh, and with coyotes uh, and work that I did in Arizona early on. Uh, <clears throat> and then eventually coming back to Canada and to Riding Mountain and uh, Wood Buffalo National Park and, and those areas. But my early, early on, I have to say, I uh, had this uh, affinity uh, for wolves uh, and I would say all dog-like animals uh, that has stayed with me uh, since I was a small child. And surprisingly, my first encounter uh, with a wolf was in in the Apennines in Italy when I was about six years old and traveling with my father. And, uh, uh, And it's continued from there. Uh, you know, and then uh, I don't think that uh, uh, much has changed in the way I view the world since I was, you know, a little uh, a small child, and uh, that's a bit of a surprise to me now that I'm, you know, 68 years old and look back and think, boy, uh, the world is much the same as I thought it was, and uh, and the way I viewed it. But uh, um, you know, that's it's really where I am now is is working with uh people like chris uh in particular and uh <clears throat> that which has of course been a, a absolute blessing for me is, is being able to and having the opportunity to have uh people to associate with like chris and continue who continue to inspire and inform all of what i do and and how the world uh, I, I, how I view the world, um, but that, I, I think you know. Uh, uh, I, well, I probably shouldn't say too much more about this. Okay. 
So turning to you, Chris, you're a, a scholar with a Ph.D. in evolutionary ecology, with, uh, but are you're also a serious surfer and an advocate uh, devoting to protecting, among other wild places, British Columbia's rain coast. And your work is broadened to include protecting the interests of indigenous peoples as well. And you've described the rain coast as a salmon, grizzly bear, human ecosystem. Can you flesh out what you mean by that? Sure, Louisa. Yeah, a, a lot of uh, that thinking was inspired by by Paul and and others at the Rain Coast Conservation uh, Foundation, for for which we both uh, work and have been with Rain Coast for going on twenty years now. Um, we we kind of consider grizzlies, salmon, and human beings as forming kind of this hole among these really important parts to the coastal landscape up in British Columbia, Canada. I mean, there's some obvious connections. Grizzlies make most of their living uh, from salmon uh, in these forests. Salmon evolved uh, under predation from grizzly bears. and But some other connections are really important, and often wildlife scientists don't think of them or think of them very deeply, but but we like to, and in part that's that's shaped by spending time with indigenous people. Um, so, for example, the people uh, of this coast in large part um, refer and think of and conceive of grizzly bears as not just animals uh, to protect, but they consider them ancestors or relatives. And, and what goes with that is a fundamentally different way of interacting with them and, and managing the bears. In essence, they manage themselves around, around bears. Indigenous people also have a very strong relationship with salmon. I mean, it's this very uh, nutritious, formally predictable, formally very abundant food supply that, that pardon the pun, spawned uh, these large, large societies that thrived on our coast before um, Europeans showed up. Um, so it's, it's working with indigenous peoples who are interested in not only safeguarding grizzly bears and salmon from, from the threats that, that, threat, that threaten them, but also working with them towards a renewed sense of sovereignty. Uh, that is to say, managing what they consider, and I consider, their lands and resources uh, in much, much healthier ways after uh, European settlers essentially dismantled these systems through uh, Western management and pretty severe over-exploitation. So it's a really exciting work that, that, that Paul and I and, and Rain Coast are involved in, and uh, we're making headway and we're seeing real change, and it's a pretty inspiring project to be involved in. Great. So just curious, Chris, did your surfer habit predate your interest in conservation? <laughs> Oh boy, you know, it's hard to, to unpack all the inspirations. I've always been a, a coastal kid, and, you know, all these sort of narratives run through my mind from, you know, the first time. Uh, my mom actually took me surfing as a child in these cold, cold waters to hanging out with my dog uh, and sniffing around uh, tide pools uh, when I was a little boy to, um, you know, meeting Paul for the first time, actually. Uh, this was on Paul's 50th birthday. That's right. Uh, that's, yeah, in, in the Rocky Mountains, and I had taken mm -hmm. a year off. Uh, undergraduate studies to volunteer for a project that Paul led uh, in the mountain, Canadian mountain parks. And uh, I had forever waited to meet Paul, or it seemed like forever. And, and to my delight, here was this uh, really uh, incredible man that, that uh, listened to me and, and uh, my ambitions for, for doing work like that, work on wolves, in a very different place in these temperate rainforests in, in Canada. And kind of from that very moment at that, that dinner at, I think, an Italian restaurant, um, Paul showed me nothing but um, this incredible support and unbridled enthusiasm for our work. And uh, I just feel like the luckiest guy in the world to be to 
have had the opportunity and, and continue to work with Paul. Wonderful. Yeah, so Paul, I, I, well, go ahead. That, that's uh, you know so generous of Chris, and and uh, you know my recollection of all of that is is similar to Chris's, uh, uh, but the difference being that that suddenly. You know, the teacher becomes the student in, in the relationship uh, over time. And, uh, you know, that the affinity I would have to equate, and uh, this might sound odd to people, but to a love affair that you have, and, and you can't quite put uh, and understand why, why it's uh, such an important, uh, you know, uh, uh, attraction. Uh, but it, it's been ongoing, and, and I think that... Uh, the the benefits have have probably been mutual for uh both of us and and I hope you know that uh, all of us will continue until uh it, it can't for one reason or another continue anymore because one of us <clears throat> you know might not be there but uh you know this has been incredibly inspiring in terms of the kind of creativity that we've been able to, to bring to uh, the research that we do and the, and the writing that we do and, and the kinds of understandings that we've been able to uh, uh, probably achieve that uh, otherwise wouldn't have been available to us. So I, right. it's, it's really, really been a special. remarkable journey. Yeah. So, Paul, you and Chris and your colleague Kyle Artell recently published a paper finding close ties between the abundance of salmon on the coastal British Columbia and the rate of grizzly bear human conflicts. Maybe you can unpack this connection and its implications for the management and conservation of grizzly bears. Well, I, I think that it, it probably could be uh, – uh, best stated that in some ways it wasn't uh, a surprise that there would be a relationship, uh, given the the uh, emphasis that uh, grizzly bears place, place on uh, salmon in the coastal communities, and that you can imagine with the, either the absence or the uh, decline of uh, salmon available, that there might be some changes in uh, how uh, grizzly bears uh, behave and how they might. Uh, interact with with people uh, as a consequence of that, given the motivation that they have to uh, still uh, attain you know as many calories as they possibly can during the summer months before they head to hibernation uh, and of course the the findings that which you, i don 't think that you uh, <clears throat> mentioned really were that we there were changes that uh, seemed to occur uh, related to the availability and abundance uh, of uh, salmon for grizzly bears uh, seasonally uh, that w where uh, there w were increases in uh, uh, conflicts or in, in the potential for conflicts uh, in those periods of uh, uh, low availability and abundance uh, for salmon. And in some ways, I, I think, uh, and this originally came from Chris, I, I think that uh, that was uh, not unexpected it had just never been demonstrated uh but from a conservation perspective the major implication was that uh and finding is that uh, bears that uh, on occasion do get into trouble with people uh that the management most often uh, applied is is lethal and that's uh uh, meaning that the bears are killed, and that's viewed to be the solution to uh, uh, reduce problems in it, or at least uh, minimize them in the future with those bears being removed and, uh, and removal again by being lethal. Um, but that, that's not really what, the, what our work uh, showed in this case. And, and I think that Chris can elaborate on that, uh, again, because conceptually it's, this is – uh, this paper really was, and the foundation for it came from uh, Chris's sort of insights into uh, the behavior and ecology of uh, uh, grizzly bears on the coast and the kinds of expectations that we might have uh, if, in fact, the foods that they depend on uh, for uh, their sustenance aren't available to them. Right. Do you want to expand on that, Chris? Sure, sure. I, I guess the the penny dropped or, or whatever the expression is 
when we were reading some newspaper articles, uh, just uh, two pieces just a week apart, and, and one said, uh, you know, it's 2008 here, and it's the lowest salmon runs in recorded history that we've seen in certain areas of the coast. And, and then the next one, a week later, by the same reporter actually said, we've never seen grizzly bear attacks this frequent before, um, but didn't reference salmon. And so kind of the idea was born, and, and, and the bottom line is if society and, and managers are interested in reducing uh, the frequency and, and probably severity uh, of human bear conflict, then we should give bears salmon, not bullets. And, and what I mean by that, and Paul's already referred to it, is when we looked at several decades of data, um, we find no signal uh, that either trophy hunting or conflict kills, that is to say, say conservation officers killing grizzly bears, neither of those two approaches has any effect uh, on uh, grizzly bear conflict, even though by managers and the hunting lobbyists, um, those arguments are put forward that if we kill bears uh, and reduce their populations um, and remove problem individuals, we should see less conflict in the future. We found no support for that whatsoever, but we did find, as Paul mentioned, pretty strong support uh, for a relationship between salmon abundance and uh, conflict. And in our best model or best statistical way to describe that relationship, we find that in years with a 50% decline in salmon abundance over the previous year, which happens actually remarkably uh, commonly in, in salmon, uh, we can expect based on 30 years of data that the frequency of conflict occurrences goes up by about 20%, uh, a non-trivial amount. So there's a clear signal and a kind of a reminder that if we uh, want to manage terrestrial wildlife, um, we ought to think more broadly than just uh, about terrestrial resources. In this case, we have to think about resources that come from the ocean, which in Canada and, and many jurisdictions um, are managed by a different uh, agency, a federal agency mm -hmm. in, in Canada, right. whereas the bears are managed by the province. Right, right. And very, and Louisa, very similar. Oh, go ahead. And Louisa, and this obviously can be extended to the work that you've done in uh, for, for so many years in, in the U.S. and in, in the West, particularly around Yellowstone, uh, and considering the historical legacy of uh, grizzly bears, uh, where they, salmon were one of the major uh, foods available to them for uh, their uh, most of history, uh, and you know, and that now is not the case, of course, and. Uh, other issues, uh, for example, around the, the loss of uh, white bark pine, yeah. uh, which you've written about uh, previously, and mm -hmm. uh, others as well. And what, in fact, that might mean for grizzly bears and the potential for uh, conflict with uh, people within the region. Um, right, right. I think you can extend conceptually again uh, oh, from the work that we did, have done here. So, Chris, you have an interesting paper uh, that states a little bit, um, but you and your colleagues argued in a publication, uh, it was pretty stunning, that hunters, uh, who you called super predators, are changing the course of evolution of prey animals, such as elk and bighorn sheep. Maybe you can explain how this works and what your concerns are. Sure, sure. Um yeah, we, we use the, the title super predators to describe not only hunters, but actually fishers, um, uh, hu human beings that are, in our view, predators, uh, but not solely any old predator. We think they're super predators for a number of reasons. They're, they're, they prey commonly and very intensively on other predators, uh, alone making them a super predator. Uh, they have the largest predatory niche or, you know, a list of menu items compared with any other predator. Um, 
and they um, exploit at fi far higher rates uh, than any other, at least vertebrate predator, um, especially in the oceans and especially when hunters prey on carnivores uh, like grizzly bears or wolves or mountain lions, etc. Um, and so some of our work uh, looked at just a comp uh, comparison of exploitation rates, and we found uh, the central result was this asymmetry in what we as humans take from the natural world and natural populations. Uh, for example, in the oceans, we take about 14 times the median rate of adult prey from populations than do other predators in the oceans. A pretty stunning result. Uh, then when it comes to land, human hunters take about the same uh, median rate uh, from herbivore populations than do vertebrate predators like wolves and lions, etc. But uniquely, humans turn large predators into prey, killing them at about nine times the median rate at which other predators kill predators. So pretty, pretty stunning differences between hunters, fishers, and the rest of uh, the world, the natural uh, consumers that prey on, on vertebrates. And another thing that we do very uniquely is target almost exclusively uh, large reproductive aged adults. And that's a very rare pattern in the natural world. Mostly predators, as you know, take uh, the newly born, especially, you know, the calves on land or juvenile fishes in the ocean, or maybe to a lesser extent, the, the nearly dead, the older, weaker, injured, etc. animals. And, and because of both the uh, highly exploitative, you know, high rates of harvest that, that humans impose and this very different, what we call phenotypic target of prey, um, humans have emerged as a really powerful uh, agent of evolutionary change. We're shrinking fishes, we're changing their, their growth rates on land, we're influencing and shrinking the body size of animals, the size of their ornaments, etc. because we take the largest ones out of populations on average, giving a selective advantage to those uh, remaining individuals that have uh, smaller horns or slower growth rates, etc. So, so kind of an equal ecological and evolutionary terms, there is nothing like us out there. Um, and a reminder that um, something's different, something's uh, perhaps wrong with how we're engaging with the natural world. And it, and it was some fascinating work because it really did um, take this basically fundamental natural history uh, to compare us to other predators and, and find such stunning results. Wow. Wow. And, and, and you know, what, what Paul and I have thought a lot about the, the, these comparisons and why it was useful to do these. And what we keep coming back to is the fact that, that natural predators, things like grizzly bears or wolves or mountain lions or, or say predatory fishes can in fact instruct us as human beings and as managers uh, as to how to best manage populations. After all, these predators which co-evolved with resources like salmon or elk or deer or whatever for, for hundreds of thousands or millions of years are in our view the best and most appropriate models for truly sustainable exploitation. And in contrast, what we see humans doing to the natural world is, is grossly deviant. And it's no wonder why the world is falling apart before our eyes. And uh, to, uh, in addition to that, with, uh, almost without exception, is that uh, predators are both manage and conserve, and uh, that's something that, that <clears throat> humans, for the most part, have failed to do, and uh, th that's a really interesting lesson that uh, we should be able to take and, and apply. Right. Right. If we will. Yeah, yeah because, uh, uh, you know, it's striking that, the, that, uh, that so many of these populations and 
both not only did they co-evolve the predators and the prey, uh, but they've been able to uh, be sustained over millennia, literally, right. Um, right. and uh, successfully w- without uh, you know, seriously depleting populations to the point of where they disappear. And, and that's right. where the conservation message comes in, and it's also, I think, somewhat of, uh, encouraging that uh, if we want to turn to management, which I don't always consider to be uh, uh, directly related to conservation, the, the populations can be managed uh, and conservation can take place simultaneously. Right. right. So, Paul, you make, you've made the case that the movement to conserve large carnivores has with a focus on the status and population of status of population and numbers has long given short shrift to the welfare of individuals and their suffering, whether that suffering is in the form of destruction of habitat or displacement of animals or being shot at, say, by ranchers or handled by researchers. Can you share your thinking on that issue and whether you think we're making progress? Yeah, you know, that's uh, something that I think has been on on my mind, and uh, again, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, we've written about this, uh, Chris and I, uh, and, and published on it. Um, first of all, I, I think that our, the claims that we've made that uh, both management and conservation have certainly ignored, have been focused on numbers of animals and certainly uh, have ignored the welfare of animals are uh, valid. I, I think that those are real. I have to say that we weren't the first to, uh, you know, speak to this. Uh, in fact, uh, someone you know very well spoke to this early on with relate, as it related to grizzly bears in, in Yellowstone and uh, vicinity, Dave Matson and uh, uh, wrote about these issues, I would say, in the late 90s, and, I'm sorry, late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and then we, we, we've ex- expanded on that to uh, some degree. But I, I, I think it's without question that that's been the case for some time and uh, continues uh, to be that the welfare of individuals uh, in particular uh, and extended populations has just not been a consideration. And uh, uh, we've made the point, I think, quite strongly that that's not only from – people involved in, in management of, of wildlife or ecologists or uh, conservationists, but that also extends to animal welfareists whose focus has been primarily on uh, uh, domestic animals and, uh, and not on the animals in the wild. Um, I think that we've brought a lot of attention to that. We certainly see much of the language that we introduced uh, being repeated now, which is always a good sign. Uh, and I, I think that there is progress being made, that there's far more consideration being given uh, to animal welfare, uh, in particular wild animals, than, than uh, occurred before we really, uh, you know, broached this. At, at Rain Coast, uh, we made a concerted effort to make this part of what we do and to associate animal welfare and conservation uh, and that the two, as we note in our uh, in one of our publications, that they're probably two sides of the same coin, or if they're not, they should be. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the the awareness has increased tremendously uh, around this. And, and again, giving credit to the people who early on uh, raised this issue, like uh, Mark Beckoff being one, and, and mm-hmm. of course uh, most of the people who worked with primates uh, really. Mm-hmm were uh, well aware of this and were uh, proponents of, of animal welfare and, and more of a focus on individuals. Um, some of the things that we've talked about that become difficult for many people to accept, however, are uh, discussions around uh, a quality of life of, of both individuals and, uh, mm-hmm. and populations of uh, individuals, why we're concerned about that and that those are uh, problems that we think uh, need to be addressed that, uh, you know, certainly we can have in many cases uh, large numbers of animals but living in horrible impoverished conditions where their quality of life is, is uh, less than, than obviously what it should be. And, and we've equated that 
on, on many occasions uh, to uh, similar situations that people endure who uh, might live in inner cities and live in ghettos. And uh, uh, we referred to some of the areas in, in many cases where uh, wild populations ex exist uh, in terrible conditions as, as wildlife ghettos. And, uh, you know, really we, uh, we believe that that's the case. But I, but I do think we're making progress in that area. And again, I think that the measure for that is that we see much of what we've written about now and discussed uh, publicly as, as being repeated uh, by others. And um, I think that just the initial phase of making progress is the increased awareness. And then, of course, we, we most are concerned about application. And we think that that is, uh, is beginning to happen now. Yeah, a stunning, a stunning example of of an application that that is one of the very uh, best things that Raincoast has ever done. Uh, was um, a completely different approach to safeguarding uh, carnivores like grizzly bears and, and wolves in, in this Great Bear Rainforest region of Canada, and that is after several years of lobbying for changes to um, sport and trophy hunting in the area to minor and significant improvements, but nothing enduring, uh, Rankos did something that had never been done before, and that is buy out the exclusive right uh, to guide foreign hunters looking for grizzly and other trophies in uh, an amazingly large area, uh, greater than the greater Yellowstone ecosystem area, in fact. And since our initial purchase uh, of the guide outfitting territory in 2003, we've acquired two others uh, so that we have extinguished about half of the trophy hunting in uh, an area about 35,000 square kilometers. So real tangible um, differences have been made that have improved uh, the quality of life, obviously, of, of carnivores in the area. Uh, and we paid a lot of money to do this, uh, somewhere in the area of 1.6 million collectively. Um, but the lives that we've saved and the suffering uh, that we've uh, avoided uh, for those animals t to endure is, is priceless. And our ambition in the next year or so is to buy up the remaining licenses. And uh, all we have to do, it's, it's simple. But, but ambitious, uh, like we like doing at Raincoast, is raise another about $2 million to do that. And <laughs> <laughs> then the coast will be locked up and, and changed forever. Uh, and, we, and we will do that. You know, in the, in the bluntest of terms, is what we bought were the rights uh, initially to kill these animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we bought the rights not to kill them. Mm -hmm. And that's right. where the, how the protection is, is extended. Um, and I, I think, uh, I, I, interestingly enough, uh, Louisa, and I think you, you'll appreciate that it's, uh, when uh, Raincoast uh, uh, and, us, and all of us decided that we would make animal welfare uh, a, a serious issue and always associate it with what we do in conservation, um, everyone advised us that you cannot be talking about ethics, you cannot be talking about morals. Mm -hmm. Uh, you cannot be talking about animal welfare uh, and have any credibility at all, and uh, that this is going to be, uh, as a strategy, uh, is not going to be workable, and uh, Raincoast as an organization will suffer as a consequence of that. <laughs> and we ignored that advice uh, in part because we knew that we were on the, we had a very, very solid foundation as a research organization as well, right. uh, you know, given that we publish extensively and, uh, right. uh, and, and widely. Right. Uh, and we, we um, again, for, for that reason, we felt that we could ignore that and, and right. uh, you know, continue doing with uh, working both in uh, science, as we always have, and animal welfare. Right. Well, it's a stunning success. And uh, 
you're obviously winning, and, and kudos to that. But I think you've, you've obviously got the backing of public opinion, and, and speaking of which, maybe this one's to you. Um, so the death of Cecil the Lion last summer, uh, but for, you know, was, was such an enormous favorite, this lion, and Wong E. Park in Zimbabwe was killed by this Minnesota dentist, Walter Palmer, uh, who, you know, was, was devastated in the public media, an unprecedented protest. And um, the death of the lion was followed by the killing of a grizzly bear, Cheeky, on the British Columbia coast by NHL hockey player Clayton Stoner, and another huge public protest in the social media, and uh, the subsequent conviction last fall of Clayton Stoner. What do you think these events mean, and what do they portend? Maybe to you, Chris. Oh, I, I think they're a clear signal that, that uh, society is changing and, and no longer tolerant that a, a, a minority, narrow, narrow special interest groups, uh, trophy hunters, um, can get away with behaving in a way. Uh, I think in general, uh, societies uh, permits people to kill animals if, if they do so for food and to put to, to feed their families, etc. But to kill an animal just to feed one's ego um, is and is, for pleasure and for pleasure is is pretty sick stuff that that the world's just not willing to tolerate anymore. So um, those changing societal norms coupled with uh, the resurgence of of indigenous governments in our area, we are hopeful that within the next uh, year or two that. Um, we will see the end of, of all grizzly bear hunting on the coast of British Columbia. Wow. I, I hope you will. And uh, it's stunning to see the progress you're making. Um, well, and public opposition in B.C. to uh, uh, trophy hunting in particular of grizzly bears, uh, I think, as you probably know, Louise, uh, 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 most recent uh, polling has shown somewhere close to 90% opposition. Is that correct, mm-hmm. Chris? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's incredible. So, either one of you, um, here in Yellowstone, <laughs> managers are talking about renewing a grizzly bear hunt after a 40-year hiatus and delisting grizzly bears or removing their protections. Um, maybe you can reflect on your thoughts about Yellowstone. Go ahead, Paul. Well, uh, of course, uh, my initial reaction to that is the same reaction I would have had, uh, you know, 40 years ago in anticipating that that could happen. Is that I find it appalling, uh, clearly unnecessary, and it's mostly pandering uh, to, to of course, states and, again, special interests. Uh, with the understanding, in some cases, from many of the people who are involved in making these decisions, that that is necessary pandering. Uh, to appease uh, those special interests and others who um, really are opposed to even having grizzly bears uh, anywhere, you know, or the recovery of them. Um, You know, this is the the whole discussion that's taken place for so many years around social license and uh, that you need to uh, address that by uh, doing the distasteful uh, thing of allowing people to uh, express their dissatisfaction with the uh, grizzly bears and recovery of grizzly bears by allowing them to kill them. Um, That's really what's taking place, and it has nothing to do with, uh, of course, conservation or a sober understanding of of where grizzly bears are in terms of uh, the recovery from where they were historically and what what uh, recovery really means as opposed to what we would uh, you know like it to mean for uh, convenient reasons um, i i don't think this is a surprising uh, happening uh, again I, most of us have uh, of course, anticipated that this would be the case and that we would uh, at some point come uh, ha- have to uh, confront this, um, unfortunately. I-, I think what's been of great importance is the uh, response of uh, Aboriginals in the states or First Nations, as we often refer to them, uh, and their 
uh, lack of support for some of the changes that, uh, that we might see taking place uh, as a consequence of uh, the changes in, um, uh, well, just uh, allowing the hunting of grizzly bears, et cetera. And the opposition there has been, I, I think, really encouraging to see. And, and I think that this is kind of the nature of the discussions that take place not only in, in Yellowstone, but really globally when it comes to both endangered species and particularly uh, carnivores, you know, that there really are, and, and we've discussed this, no ecological or biological or reasons in conservation to be killing these animals. Chris, maybe uh, this is shifting gears a little bit, but um, you obviously work a lot with uh, Native peoples along the coast and the rain coast and uh, weaving traditional knowledge and um, perhaps more conventional science-based knowledge, uh, which some might sort of think about as integrating chalk and cheese uh, in some ways. Can, can you perhaps talk a little more about what your work in that arena is like? Sure. It's, it's fascinating, rich, uh, complex. Um, uh, unlike anything I've ever done before, and uh, and incredibly rewarding, and and I think the key to it is is and, and Paul's being an advocate of this from the very beginning is just uh, moving slowly, taking our time to listen more than we speak in these communities, especially at first, because um, after all, scientists um, have been in many cases, very unkind to indigenous people and abusive in, in kind of recent decades, and, and some continue to be so. Um, so developing relationships has been a key part to integrating the worldviews of indigenous people and, and, and Western science in, in our projects that we, we partner with local communities in. And, uh, and you know, on one at first glance, it may seem like really different um, uh, approaches, but you know, we share the same physical reality. Uh, indigenous people have had connections to place and animals you know, on Narcos for 10,000 years or more, and whereas they may not have had, say, the molecular tools. Uh, that we can bring as as scientists, um, they do have historical and contemporary information that that we just can't develop here in urban centers at our universities, uh, no matter how good our tools are. Um, so we find kind of this uh, it's an overused word, but it's it's really fitting this synergy when we uh, engage with communities and they bring uh, knowledge of, of animals and, and even hypotheses to tests uh, that, that we would never have dreamed up in our most creative of moments here in, in institutions or working with nonprofits. So it's been really rewarding and, uh, and it's especially rewarding working with these same people and their government systems that are reemerging after being um, kind of beat down by colonial forces for, for a few hundred years and watching them make change empowered by increasing legal and societal uh, authority to do so, to be at the helm and in resource management decisions that affect everything from bears to salmon to uh, perhaps one day more significantly climate. So uh, we feel really lucky to, to be working um, with Indigenous people. It's, it's kind of uh, one of the very most important aspects of our work. You know, the, the colonial perspective of, of indigenous people was very similar to the perspective they had towards uh, predators in North America. And the treatment of both uh, large carnivores and predators uh, and uh, First Nations people uh, were very similar. Or the mistreatment. Oh, yeah, right, exactly. Thank you so much, Paul and Chris. We're here with the Grizzly Beat, and we're with Drs. Paul Paquette and Chris Daramont, who are working to protect wolves, grizzly bears, indigenous cultures, and vast landscapes on British Columbia's rain coast. Thank you so much. Thank you.